The recordings we're about to hear were made at King Edward's Aston in 1965. They came about as a result of an international teacher exchange program between Britain and the United States. In 1963, Mr. Melvin Merzen arrived at Aston from Detroit, Michigan, and he taught at the school for some 18 months. His main subject was English, but he also taught history, and he was a very popular master during his time with us. Soon after he returned to his school in the USA, I put together a series of recordings which captured our everyday life at Aston. These were sent to Mr. Merzen so that he could show his pupils in Detroit how differently things were done on this side of the Atlantic. The material was gathered on an old-style reel-to-reel tape recorder. Remember those? And when that technology became obsolete, I transferred it a few years later onto two vinyl discs, four sides in all. Now, of course, 40 years on, the recordings have become something of a collector's item for those of us lucky enough to have shared those times together at Aston in the 1960s. We were still taught, in part, by masters who had been there since the 1930s, Having left Aston for war service, they returned in 1945 and in many cases spent their whole working lives at one school, our school. To us 12 to 17 year olds, Aston felt steeped in tradition and I think it was largely due to this feeling of continuity led by the old brigade of long-serving masters that this was the case. How many of us still have vivid memories of Mr Pedley, Mr. Pickering, Mr. Calvert and others sweeping through the cloisters of the old building in flowing black gowns on their way to their next lesson. On this recording we will be reminded of a number of the old timers, Mr. Entwistle, Mr. Hobson, Mr. Calvert and above all L.G. Brandon, that gentleman of a headmaster who everyone respected and indeed in retrospect even revered. Alongside the masters who arrived at Aston before the Second World War, we'll also hear some of the newcomers as they take their lessons. But at King Edward's, life didn't stop at 4pm. There was a whole range of activities that pupils could choose to follow after normal school hours. We'll hear snatches from the Sixth Form Society, a play rehearsal from the drama group, plus a Parents Association folk song evening, and to end it all, there's a rendering of the school song. Now, it must be remembered that this recording was made 40 years ago on old-style equipment by 16-year-olds, not in a studio, but in a school classroom. Production standards may not have been the highest in the world, but if we look beyond that, we have here a unique snapshot of King Edward's at a particular point in its history. I do hope these excerpts from Life at Aston will bring back your own memories of the staff and the times featured on this recording. Most of us would agree that the school had profound influence on our lives and it's good to take a moment to remember the masters and the pupils who were part of our everyday world so long ago. We start, appropriately, with second form registration taken by Mr Collins. Dave Collins was next pupil of Sherborne School in Dorset whose speciality was English. He was a leading light in the drama group and staged several productions during his three years with us. He was later to be seen on television advertising Condor tobacco, sucking on a pipe while experiencing that Condor moment. Clark, Cook, Davis, Fairhurst, Farnsworth, Bell, Bellows, Bernie, Goddard, Hall, Harris, Hutchinson, Keane, Littleton, Lockwood, McLeod, Med, Middleton, Mitchell, Norris, Page, Peach, Scott, Sneed, Train, Wayne, Waldron, Wilcox, Wilkinson. Directly after registration, we used to go to morning assembly. Until 1963, this was held every morning in big school in the old building, but once the new block was built, we transferred assembly across the road, and this released big school to become an extensive library of some 8,000 books. We're about to hear a hymn, a reading by Norman Richardson, and the day's school notices read by Peter Neve. 
Norman went on to become a headmaster, and Peter left Aston to become an airline pilot with BOAC, the forerunner of British Airways. Sick Form Society. In a university challenge competition yesterday, Aston won by 244 points to Sutton Grammar School's 237 points. Templey House. Anyone in Templey House keen on playing for the badminton team should remain behind for a few moments afterwards. All boys who wish to enter for the Anglo-French Society Schools Branch French Prose Reading Competition to be held on Wednesday, March the 2nd, should see Mr. Entwistle at recess today. Money, please. There are still some who have not yet given Mr. Collins their ticket money for the theatre visits. Would they bring it at recess to room six, please? Orchestra. There will be a meeting for the full orchestra in the music room at recess today. Photographic Society. The Photographic Society will meet tomorrow night at 4.10pm in D1 when Mr. Fenton will give a talk on exposure. All boys, especially new members, are welcome. Cross-country running. Members of the first team are to meet at the foot of the stairs near the common room at the beginning of recess today. Trombone lessons. Free tuition on the trombone will shortly be available during Thursday lunch hour. Any second, third or fourth former wishing to take advantage of this opportunity is asked to see Mr. Jones during the course of today. Thank you. witnesses by Clive Sampson. He came to me with his eyes and asked for water, stretched out his hands and spoke. His mind burned into mine like the noon sun. My pitcher of thoughts broke. I had not noticed him at rest by the wellhead, shadowed by the rare tree. But as I carried my shame into its coolness, his eyes awaited me. 
I tried to avoid them as I drew the well roped taut through a mindless hand. I saw his robe cross the speckled sunlight, his feet stir the hot sand. I saw his face, it was white with road dust, whiter than any stone, but his eyes were ageless and deep as well shafts as they met my own. <coughs> they unroofed my brain with their profound gazing, made the heart a molten thing. <coughs> Every powdered thought unveiled itself under their questioning. He spoke of water to cleanse the spirit. I tried not to understand. He followed me along the road of my evasions, and when it ceased in sand, he brought me home from my self-forced journey. He showed me my own soul, cracked and dry as a discarded wineskin, and made it whole. He came to me with his eyes and asked for water, stretched out his hands and spoke. As I carried my peace back to the streets of Sikar, a new world woke. He ends the reading. Prayers 22 and 46. Almighty God, Almighty God, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, went about doing good, and healing all the manner of sickness and disease among the people. Continue with the disease to be his gracious work amongst us. Cheer and heal the sick. Instill sympathy and devotion to doctors and nurses. And the same time, blessing on all who remain both of the rest suffering. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, our Father, God has heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we have given them the trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power of the Lord. <laughs> Unto God's gracious mercy and protection we commit ourselves. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us peace now and evermore. In a moment, we'll hear Leonard Brandon explain how the King Edward's Foundation came about. All of us who remember old GB would agree that he was the most courteous of men and a real gentleman. He became headmaster of King Edward's in 1937, coming to us from Latimer Upper School in London, and he stayed for exactly 100 terms, that's 33 years, before retiring in 1970. LGB was a great educationalist, a writer of definitive school history books, and a member of the National Schools Council. He loved music himself, and he arranged for pupils to use the extensive music library at the Birmingham and Midland Institute in the city centre, at a time before record borrowing became more widely available. He was also a very competent bridge player of competition standard. Mr. Brandon organised the evacuation of the school to Ashby de la Zouche near Leicester in the Second World War, and this experience led him to advocate an opportunity for boarding for all pupils. He pioneered the purchase of Longdon Hall, which we all remember with great affection, and of which we have many stories to tell. The school magazine for 1970, the year he retired, summed up our feelings. It said... There are truly thousands of us who recognise that LGB was the wisest and also the cleverest man we knew. He devoted more than half a lifetime of service to us. We are deeply grateful and mourn his passing. There are seven King Edward schools in Birmingham. The oldest of them was founded in 1552 as a result of a charter which was sealed by King Edward VI. The land which he then gave over to the new governors did not belong to him, but had come from the Guild of the Holy Cross. In the 17th and 18th centuries, other schools were added, 
and eventually in the 19th century there was a large girls school which later became a direct grant school and five grammar schools which are now called voluntary aided schools. Aston is one of these. Originally there were both boys and girls at Aston. They were in buildings which in shape were identical but were separated by a high wall across the playground. In 1911 the girls left Aston and went to a fine new building in Hansworth and the parts of the school which they had used were adapted for other purposes. This was the situation until 1963 when a fine new block was built across the road from the old building and in this new block we have our laboratories, gymnasium, assembly hall, dining room and workshops. Between 1939 and 1945, most of the school was evacuated to Ashby de la Zouche in Leicestershire, and when they returned, there was a steady growth in the size of the sixth form, and indeed in the size of the school altogether. Now the school numbers between 570 and 600, and in the sixth form, there are approximately 120 to 140 boys. Next, Mr. Calvert explains for the benefit of the American pupils for whom the original recording was made how the school was run. Stan Calvert arrived at Aston in 1936. At the time of this recording he was deputy head and had what seemed to us to be an enormous office with a large desk surrounded by banks of filing cabinets. His own subject was Latin but he spent much of his time on the day-to-day -day running of the school as well as organising clubs and societies. He retired in 1976, having spent his entire 40 years career at Aston. We admit each year, on the results of what is called the 11 plus examination, about 90 boys, who are divided into three forms, named 1R, 1S and 1T. Until this year they were called 1A, 1B and 1C, but now that we have abandoned streaming, the new nomenclature is an attempt to avoid discrimination. The subjects of the curriculum in the first year are history, geography, religious education, French, mathematics, science, music, art, handicraft and physical education. In the second year there is a further choice between German and Latin. These subjects are generally studied up to the fifth year where there is selection according to inclination, ability or prospective career. At the end of this year is taken the first public examination the General Certificate of Education at ordinary level. Each boy takes English language and English literature, French and mathematics, plus three or four optional subjects. After five years, rather less than half the pupils leave school, while the rest start a two or three year course in the sixth form, leading to advanced level General Certificate of Education. Almost half take art subjects and half science. Most pupils take four subjects at advanced level, general studies and three others. A good proportion of the sixth formers go on to university. Many others take apprenticeships, which involve alternate periods of work and study and are known as sandwich courses. The school week consists of 40 periods of 40 minutes each, eight per day. Morning school starts at 8.45 with registration and assembly. After three periods, there is a recess when the tuck shop does good business. The lunch break is from 12.50 to 2 o'clock and afternoon school finishes at 4 o'clock. All boys are expected to do homework from one and a half hours to three hours per evening according to age. Each form has a form representative to assist with the routine duties and the general discipline of the school is in the hands of prefects chosen from the fifth and sixth forms. At their head is a school captain with one or two vice captains. Next, a session with Don Checkland, Geography Master at Aston between 1962 and 1989. California's had a big population boom. I should say, what, since the 1900s and particularly since about 1940s. Why? But, um, well, people like it there. Uh, 
<laughs> Why do I like it there, Middleton? The climate is... Well, people just like it. Um, it's nice and warm. Um, How warm? It's congenial to work in. People like to work in a sort of equable climate where it's... It's not roasting hot or it's not completely dry. In other words, the reasons for the population rise is simply the climate, Morris? I wonder if that was the only reason. What are the other reasons? Well, uh, in the war they wanted... In the war they wanted to develop the industry over that region. <coughs> this is the government. This is so they, they develop the industry and the people go there for the jobs. So what is the reason for the rise of industry in this area, Orphan? I think um, mainly it's um, employment. The fact that um, the employment, the possibility of employment there should have been a factor in the increase of the Negro population, which moved from the south, which um, didn't think so. I just thought so. The, the possibility of um, employment in, an, in a boom area would cause a rapid influx of um, population. It's all the Chinamen come around to grow their rice. <laughs> <laughs> Where do they grow rice, Mitchell? Rice. Sacramento. Sacramento. Don't forget the big influx of the Negroes, as well as the uh, farmers <laughs> from uh, Arkansas, uh, Arkansas and um, Oklahoma. During Why the, have they moved out? Well, they moved, they moved yeah. because yeah. of the, uh, the conditions within their own land. That they were destroyed by erosion. The land was destroyed by erosion. They were forced to move out. Mm. Back towards California and try it to is the there. economy of this area basically then agricultural or, or industrial, but um, basically agricultural. Mr. Entwistle was another of the old stagers, having arrived at Aston in 1937. When he retired in 1975, he had given 38 years to the school, excluding war service but he wasn't the only master who spent his whole teaching life at Keggs. Here's a roll call of some others who gave all or most of their working lives to the school. Bill Chivers, 39 years. George Painter, 43 years. Eric Pedley, 37 years. Watkin Thomas, 34 years. Harry Tyson, 41 years. Ernie Pickering, 33 years, Freddie Fenton, 32 years, Lindsay or Puffer Hayden, 26 years, Harry Jessup, 32 years, and so on and so on. All of these masters shaped the school into what it was, giving it traditions through their continuity of service. And alongside the masters there was Chaz, Charles Hudson, who came to us from the Royal Flying Corps at the end of the First World War initially as a groundsman and then a school janitor. It was Chaz who stoked the coal fires in the classrooms before heating radiators were installed. Chaz who prepared school dinners. Chaz who rang the bell to mark the change of lessons and broke up fights in the playground. And Chaz who sold us, among other things, broken biscuits from the school tuck shop at six for one old penny. How many of you remember, like me, being there on the last day of the winter term in 1961 when we were told that Chaz had died that morning in the lodge? He was 79, and even at the age of 13 we felt a genuine sadness. We were somehow conscious of a special moment in Aston's history. Part of Keggs's tradition had just been lost. But back to Joe Entwistle. He was a fluent linguist in both French and German, and we hear him here during a French lesson getting a group of first formers to answer questions in French about a map drawn on the blackboard. <laughs> Pour aller à Paris, s'il vous plaît. Pour aller à Paris, s'il vous plaît. Ne répétez pas, mais répondez. Répondez. Je pose la question. Je, je suis ici, je pose la question. Pour aller à Paris, s'il vous plaît. C'est... C'est tout droit. C'est tout droit. Pour aller à Rambouillé, s'il vous plaît. À gauche, à gauche, oui. Pour aller à Rambouillé, s'il vous plaît.
on the map, you see, for Aliyah, and uh, James, you'll tell him, will you? Good. All right. Come on, sir. Go on. For Aliyah, shout out to you, sir. From the premier route, uh, à gauche, uh, après le passage à niveau. Bon, oui. Et alors, pose la question et fais le souhait pour. Pour aller à la mer, oui, s'il vous plaît. Prenez la première route à gauche, après le pont. Après le pont. Bon, encore une fois, Cook et... We touched on the tuck shop a little earlier. The profits from the shop went towards new equipment for the school, and in 1964, these were enough to buy a new grand piano. Here's a snatch of activity at the lodge during a morning break in 1965. At 10 to 2, we began the afternoon set of lessons. We've already heard from Dave Collins. Here he is again, attempting to discuss the characterizations in George Orwell's Animal Farm with the fourth form. Trying to attract people, but so she's not really trying to, you know, make. So she's it, not really trying to attract. Yeah, but uh, really she is, and kind of uh, brush her hair and that, and <laughs> <laughs> just brush her hair and that. What's brush her hair and that? More and particular. Uh, and <laughs> you'll get your turn in a minute. Be quiet. And um. Uh, you know, look in the mirror at, at herself and uh, lipstick and yeah, keep all right. moving about. Fair so. enough. Anybody else? Any more offers? Come on. What sort of character does Molly represent? If there wasn't a seat on the bus and she had to stand up, she'd yeah. um, probably get pick on somebody younger than herself and ask her to ask him or her to give her a seat. Um, how do you think she'd pick on them? How? In what sort of way? All right, Rawson, thank you, Hawkins. There's Rawson over the other side. Um, she'd probably um, sort of start talking to another woman, but make, make sure that um, she can be heard by the person she's sort of referring to. Yes. Saying, like, oh, the younger generation, in our day, we always used to... Um, <laughs> you, you think she's, um, she represents somebody middle-aged? She's just something middle-aged to you, does she? Yes. Who said that? Why does she suggest, why does Molly suggest middle age? In what way? Somebody said yes. How? All right, Hawkins again. Um, because when uh, she doesn't want, she doesn't want to conform with the revolution. She thinks it was better before the revolution. And You're referring to Orwell's horse character, isn't yes. that's why, yes. <laughs> uh, Therefore, she, she must have um, known what it was like. Um, do other people think that she's middle-aged, or do you think that she's um, young and flouncy and bouncy? Yes, Palmer. She's got no will of her own, sir. She's got no will of her own, certainly. She'll be worn out by uh, pretty things or something like that. Yeah, I think that's certainly true. And now to biology with Mr. Stark. Around here, around where you have quite a lot of the sort of build-up of the shape of the face carried out in cartilage, and you've also then got these cushioning discs between the vertebrae, which are the intervertebral discs, which can slip out when you have a slip disc. But the point is, I'm not um, sticking to the lesson by going on about the skeleton. We can sort of have a look at this again sometime. 
I've got three types of um, dentition to look at. We've got nans, which I said is omnivorous, where you've got mixed eating, you've got plant and animal materials, and we have a more or less equal development of the teeth. We've got a dog skull here, which shows us the typical carnivorous type of dentition, where the dog in the wild would normally eat only, plant, uh, only animal material. Um, this too has been cleaned up in, an, in exactly the same way. It's also been marked out with Indian ink to show you the position of the various bones of the skull. Um, we'll have a look at that in a minute or two. And then the other one is the rabbit type, which would be similar to the rat rodent type of um, dentition, where we've got quite a large gap. We've got no evidence of canine development. They don't need canine teeth. The canines are used for what? What did I say? Yes? These are used for tearing flesh. The rabbit obviously doesn't tear flesh. It gnaws at things. <coughs> and it passes food back through this little gap here, which is called a diastema, which we also get in sheep and cattle and horses and things like this. And then it's going to be ground up by these sort of very regular back teeth, back teeth being called um, molars. molars and premolars, and these are at the back. But the point is we have three different skulls, we have three different types of dentition. The human dentition, if we look at this skull now, shows the incisors at the front, which are quite broad, chisel-like teeth. They're broad across the front, but they're quite thin in themselves. They have relatively short roots to about there. You can't see on the canines the particular ridge of the root, but if we count four, get, take those four there, it means that these teeth, immediately after the four on the top, are the canines, and now you can't feel it particularly well on here. The root, in fact, would go to about there. Hugh Crosthwaite and his brother both taught at Aston in the 1960s. Hugh stayed for 17 years, although his brother moved on after only one year. Here, Hugh Crosthwaite is teaching beginner's Russian to the sixth form. It's obviously early days, as the feedback is somewhat lacking. And also page six to seven, um, exercise eight, answer the following questions. Что делают отцы и матери в воскресенье утром? Кто может ответить на этот вопрос? Вы? Отцы и матери отдыхают. Они отдыхают в воскресенье утром. Хорошо. Второй вопрос. Second question. Дети отдыхают в этот день? Кто может ответить на этот вопрос? Вы, Клаб? Не, они не отдыхают. А они, дети, играют и гуляют. You will make no progress in diplomatic circles unless you can say нет. If there's a T on the end, it's нет and not не. So, once more. Нет, они не отдыхают. Они не отдыхают. Хорошо. Третий вопрос. Где Петя любит лежать утром? Where does he like to lie in the morning? Петя очень любит лежать в теплой постели утром. Yes, listen carefully. Он очень любит лежать, not the accent, лежать в теплой постели утром. To chemistry now, and we eavesdrop on Derek Hobson, who gives an accomplished explanation of some applied chemical engineering. Let me just say a word or two about the development of the lead chamber process, because so much of our industrial uh, history is dependent upon this particular process. The first process for manufacture of sulfuric acid was patented in this country by a man called Joshua Ward 
and in this particular process he took sulphur and saltpeter, placed them in large glass spheres and uh, ignited the mixture. Now when uh, saltpeter is heated of course you get oxygen given off and uh, sulphur burns in the oxygen producing sulphur dioxide and sulphur trioxide and the sulphur trioxide uh, dissolves in water that was placed inside the, the glass sphere. The glass globe itself was bedded in sand and heated externally. Now of course the uh, quantity of sulfuric acid that could be produced by a simple process such as this was limited to the size of your glass vessel and in fact these vessels had a capacity of 66 gallons so they were pretty big when you remember that the standard sized glass carboy that you see being used for sulfuric acid in moderate sized bulk stands about so high and this holds 10 gallons. When the day's lessons ended not everyone went home. We had some 20 school societies ranging from the scientific society through the drama group to the model motor racing car club, all run by the boys themselves. We're going to call in now at a number of events. Firstly, the Sixth Form Society, here competing in a quiz with a girls' school from Sutton Coalfield. Now, second starter, five points. What was the original native race of New Zealand? <laughs> Uh, Maru's. Yeah. Second question to Sutton. <laughs> 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 Who was, um, all Sutton Coalfield was all architecture questions. Who was the architect of Coventry Cathedral? Sebastian Spence. Five points. John Piper contributed to which part of the cathedral? The windows. Um, could you be a little more for that? The window is at the side. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 In which style of architecture was the old cathedral built? Yes. Five points. Who designed the tapestry in the new cathedral? Sutherland. Graham yes. Sutherland. Now to a rehearsal for Naked Island, a play by Russell Braddon, set in wartime. Oh, can't keep the watch down any longer. I asked him what he fancied to eat instead. He said tinned peaches. Oh, rot though. The last of them went years ago. That's all I know it, mate. Don't worry, mate. We'll get them somewhere. Yeah, of course. Again, by the way. He was telling me how he could smell the grasses on Manor Mode the night before. I'd forgotten the smell. And then the possum in the tree outside the veranda began to cough. He said it sounded like scratching your fingernails against wire gourd. He did not. He does, sir. Then suddenly his mark come burst in into the door, out the door, and said, Come on, Norm, it's your turn to dry the dishes. And he don't remember anymore. Hi, Ken. Hello, fine. A couple of bits of grilled snake for you in your tuck bag. How's Norm? Fine. Sent his love and kisses. Hey, thanks, mate. Fine. How was your Italian lesson? Missed most of it. Got there late. We also did musicals. In 1965, it was Sam, the highest jumper of them all, by the American William Sarayan. We recorded a medley of songs on the tape we sent to Mr. Merzen.
Parents' Association always gave strong financial and practical support to the school's activities. In return, pupils gave concerts under the Parents' Association banner, including this folk song evening in 1965. Sometimes I'll take a great notion To jump in the river and drown 
sport has always been an important part of Aston life, notably rugger and cricket. Indeed, Watkin Thomas, who taught at the school from 1937 to 1971, played rugger for Wales and was capped 14 times. In fact, he captained Wales and also the Barbarians. Harry Jessup, the senior games master in the 1960s, here outlines the rules of rugby football for the American audience. Rugby Football Union is a team game played with 15 on each side on a rectangular pitch 100 yards by 75 yards. The goal posts are shaped like a letter H and placed on opposite ends in the middle of the goal lines. Two halves are played of 40 minutes each. The ball used is one and a half times larger than an American football. The object of the game is to score a try worth three points by grounding the ball on or beyond the opponent's goal line. This is followed by a place kick at goal over a bar and between the posts. This kick is taken anywhere on a line parallel to touch line opposite the touchdown. Each team is split into eight forwards and seven backs. The main laws. 1. The ball may not be knocked or passed forwards, that is, towards the opponent's goal line. 2. Any player in front of a teammate who has the ball in his possession is in an offside position and may be penalised in certain circumstances. 3. The ball may be kicked or carried in an effort to score. 4. Obstruction or blocking is not allowed, but the player holding the ball may be held, tackled, or thrown to the ground in order for the opponent to gain possession of the ball. Punching, kicking, or tripping an opponent is foul play, and the offender may be sent off the field. 5. Play is continuous except for stoppages. When the ball is kicked, knocked or carried off the field of play or when there has been an infringement of the laws. When the ball is off the field of play the ball is thrown in between two equal single lines of forwards formed at right angles to the sideline and five yards from it. This is called a line out. The forwards then try to obtain possession in order to mount attacking plays. Infringements. For minor ones, the forwards form a tight scrum, that is, forwards interlock in ranks of three, four and one players against the opponents, three, four and one players. And the ball is put into the tunnel so formed for each front rank to try to heal the ball backwards out of the scrum. The backs are usually the fast, elusive players who try to outflank, outmaneuver or outrun the opponents in order to score tries. Forwards are usually strong, rugged and fast players who endeavour to gain possession for themselves or the backs to mount attacking plays. Points may also be scored from penalty kicks awarded for serious infringements and from drop kicks taken during play. All scoring kicks must make the ball pass between the goal posts above the crossbar. As well as teaching languages, Ernie Entwistle was a great cricketer, and here he explains the rules of the game for the American pupils in Michigan. A bit different from baseball. The English game of cricket is played in a field having in the centre a carefully rolled pitch some 8 feet 9 inches wide and 22 yards long. At each end of the pitch, 22 yards apart, two wickets are erected facing each other. Each wicket consisting of three wooden stumps 3 feet high and 3 inches from each other with two wooden bales on top reaching from one stump to the next. The ball is hard, made of leather, weighs 5.5 ounces. The batsmen and one of the fielders called the wicketkeeper wear special equipment on legs and hands to prevent injury from the ball. There are two opposing teams, each with 11 players. The whole of one team goes onto the field. The batting side sends only two players onto the field, each going to a different wicket. 
There are two umpires who give decisions. The fielders stand anywhere except on the pitch. One of this team bowls from the side of one of the two wickets, that is, sends the ball either overarm or underarm, without throwing it, towards the stumps 22 yards away with the intention of hitting them. The batsman on the opposing side is armed with a bat, which is something like a baseball bat, but has a flat striking surface about four inches wide. With this he tries to prevent the ball from hitting the wickets, and strikes the ball if possible, so that he and his fellow batsman at the other wicket can run from wicket to wicket before the fielders return the ball to either wicket. After six balls have been bowled, the ball is bowled by a different ball, bowler from the opposite end of the pitch. A batsman who fails to defend his wicket successfully is out. He retires from the game and a new batsman takes his place. A batsman may be out in several ways. For example, he is out if the ball is caught from his bat. When ten men have been out, their runs between wickets are totaled. The teams change over. The fielding side becomes the batting side. The side scoring most runs is the winner. The stipulated length of time for a game varies considerably. It may be two hours, but in a top-class game of cricket, each side bats twice, and a game may be declared unfinished, a draw, after three or five days. A comprehensive explanation of this complex game could be likewise lengthy. Joseph Manton, who was headmaster at Aston from 1913 to 1936, was something of a poet and contributed work to school publications. Aston celebrated its 50th anniversary in 1933 during Manton's headship, and in the special souvenir handbook published for the occasion, Joe Manton wrote a poem called Discipulus Ignotus, Latin for unknown pupil. It's quite a powerful piece, and even 70 years later, many of us can relate to the words and the sentiments. Here are five of the eight verses. Out of a sombre Aston street of houses, crowding row on row, I turned to precincts where my feet first ventured fifty years ago. A strange new world was opened then of joys and sorrows, hopes and fears, and memory calls them back again across the mists of fifty years. A timid boy I entered here, first trusted then to stand alone, amidst new faces, rougher cheer, constrained, though weak, to hold my own. But friends soon gathered to my side, and here I found more love than hate, and with the years there came the pride of kinship in our little state. A stranger now is in my place, he greets me with a wondering air, as if my unfamiliar face denied my right of being there. His is the glamour now, the glow of life full flowing to the brim. His looks were friendlier, could he know how closely I am linked with him. Others have ties as strong, I know, and loyalties no less than mine, and memories as tender, though they worship at another shrine. That man should love his brother first is part of the almighty plan. My heart is where my youth was nursed. Fate made me an Edwardian. And if no memory remain of me and of my humble part, let unknown pupil be the plain memorial of one whose heart beat to a loyal tune with those who led the school in work and play, and left it richer at their close for pupils of another day. We couldn't end without a couple of verses of the school song. I've personally never forgotten the version by fourth form pupil Geoffrey Richards, which instead of Old Time is on our track, boys, in the last verse, substituted the immortal but probably true words Old Harry's on our track, boys, a reference to Harry Tyson, who not only taught us maths, but held investigations into our misdemeanours. All in all, King Edward Aston and Longton Hall made a profound impression on most, if not all of us, who had the privilege of attending. It shaped our future lives, and in many cases formed friendships for life. I do hope this recording has brought back happy memories of your time there. And now, for our pious founder, King Edward VI. <laughs> ¶¶ 